welcome. Welcome. If you are here for the Taking On Body Image webinar, you are in the right place. We'll give it a minute or two just to let everyone get logged on. Um, feel free to share in the chat where you're located. We love to hear where you're tuning in from. I'm up here in uh, southern New Hampshire, so we're having the first sunny day in a while, which is wonderful. Hopefully it will melt some of the snow. <laughs> As we go through the webinar, um, feel free to put any questions that you might have either in the chat or in the Q&A function, and we will answer those throughout. Um, so yeah, make sure you're familiar with that option. So welcome everyone. We are so glad to have you here. Like I said, um, if you are here for the Taking on Body Image, What Influences Body Image and How to Improve Your Own Webinar, you are in the right place. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Just by tuning in, you are putting energy towards yourself and getting support and learning about all of this valuable information that we're going to share today. So we are so, so happy to have you here with us today. Just a little bit about Balance. Balance is a premier eating disorder treatment facility offering boutique outpatient treatment options using evidence-based practices to provide customized care that best fits you and your loved ones in recovery. And now I'd like to introduce the staff that's here with us today. Um, joining us in this webinar is Ifoma, who's an intake coordinator here at Balance, and myself. I'm Alexandra. Hi, Ifoma. <laughs> I'm Alexandra. I'm a content creator here at Balance. And as we move through today's presentation, please feel free to share any thoughts or reactions that you have in the chat um, or submit them through the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and Foma and I will be making sure to get your questions answered along the way. Plus, we'll have some time set aside at the end of the webinar just to have a bit of a discussion and a Q&A. So please make sure you share those with us. Um, we want to be chatting with you about everything that we're going over today. Now I'd like to introduce our amazing host for today. Melanie Rogers is the founder and CEO of Balance, along with many, many other things. Having both personally <laughs> and professionally learned from her own experience with an eating disorder, Melanie fully understands the complexities of the recovery journey and is dedicated to supporting others in their quest to achieve long-term recovery. Beyond running balance. She also runs two other amazing companies, Redefine Wellness and Melanie Rogers Nutrition. Um, she is a certified eating disorder registered dietitian and supervisor and an official mentor through in the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. Um, and as a mentor, Melanie uses her vast experience to provide guidance to clinicians new to the field of eating disorders. So we are so, so lucky to have Melanie here sharing with us today on this really important topic, and I will pass it over to her now. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandra, for that lovely introduction. Welcome, everyone. We are very, very excited to be talking today about all things body image. And uh, I hope um, I hope that there are some key takeaways for you today that that might be helpful in this uh, um, honestly very difficult journey towards body image acceptance and even dare we say body positivity. So a little bit about what we're hoping to walk you through today. What I, what I'm hoping might be some key standout points for you. We're going to be talking a little bit about what body image is and what factors contribute to it. I'm sure many of these factors will resonate with you. Uh, the second section will be about concerns, uh, about when does body, when do body image concerns start? When, when are we first starting to be influenced by our surroundings? The next section we'll be looking at where you and your body image fall on the so-called body acceptance spectrum, which is where we wanna help people get to. And then what to do about healing your own body image concerns if you are struggling. And last but not least, 
how to protect yourself and to improve your body image. So those are a couple of our key points we want to cover today. So what is body image and how does it affect us? So you may or may not be aware that there are four aspects of body image and they're broken down into these key areas, perception, feelings, cognition about your body image and behavior. And so let's explore those four a little more and talk about concretely what those mean. So firstly, when we talk about perception, what we're talking about here is how we see our body, literally. So when you're looking in the mirror, uh, when you catch your, um, when you catch your reflection as you're walking down the street in the shop windows. And the key piece here, when we talk about perception, is to know that what we see is not always accurate. And actually, we have brain imaging um, studies that show that when we look in the mirror and we think we're seeing our body image, there's a great deal of inaccuracy that can go on there and distortion. So hold that in mind as we go through today's, um, today's webinar, that what we see is not always accurate. Number two, the second piece of this is our feelings then about our body. So we see an image and then we have um, a, a response. And is that response happiness? Do we think, wow, I'm looking good today? Or is it like, unfortunately, many of us where it could be disgust or grossed out by what we're seeing? And the, the amount of satisfaction or dissatisfaction you feel about your shape, weight and body parts is part of what makes up this, this second component. And then, so we see something, we have feelings about it, and then we have concrete thoughts about it. So that's the cognition piece, the third piece here. What do we then think about our body? What do we tell ourselves about our body? So our thoughts can then lead to, unfortunately, preoccupation. Because if you look in the mirror and you have an emotional reaction of disgust, then the thoughts come in, which is, I'm a disgusting person. I can't believe I've let myself go, or I can't believe I ate what I did last night, or I'm, I need to get to the gym or all of those thoughts and cognitions that start to honestly flood our thinking is part of this third aspect. That then leads us to the fourth aspect, which is behavior. What do we do as a result of how we've been triggered about our body image? Are we desiring to therefore change our appearance to hit the gym? Are we thinking, okay, that's it. I'm cutting out all my meals today. I'm going to go on a diet. Um, or do we actually even take it to another extreme where we avoid social situations due to body image shame? So as you can see here, we've broken down this whole body image piece into these key four parts uh, as a way of being able to talk about the mechanisms so that we can then break each piece down to say, well, how do we, what do we do about each piece? How can we prevent this kind of negative slide that often help happens for most of us from the perception point to the behavior. And that's a little bit about what we'll be talking about today. So in a nutshell, we've got the C piece in the top right. We see, we look in the mirror, we have a feeling about it. From that feeling, we start to think thoughts about ourselves, often negative, but what if they were positive? Think about that. And then what we do, what's our behavior? If we're thinking positively about our body, the doing what might be different to when we're thinking negatively about our body and then what we then do um, as a result of that. So these are our core pieces that we want to look at and pull apart. And here, you know, again, looking at these chain of events, we see the flaws, we feel disgust, we think our body's disgusting, and then that distress leads to behaviours, which as we know, lead to dieting, disordered eating, and in the most extreme situations, full-blown eating disorders. So how in the heck did we get here? I think this is a great question to ask ourselves. When did these concerns about Im body image really start? And I think you'll be really upset with, with the reality that they start very young. So this is a little bit about body image development. So in preschool, we start to recognize ourselves around two years of age. And then we start to compare uh, ourselves with each other around four. But that comparison is more about, you know, I have uh, brown hair and you have black hair or um, clothing. I like to wear pink clothes and you're wearing purple clothes. So it's that kind of comparison. Body size awareness 
starts around age five, but it's more to do with, I want to be a big girl. I want to be taller. Uh, it's more to do with those kind of physicalities. However, by the time we get to six, just six, we're just babies, socio-cultural factors have already started to uh, influence us. And when we talk about socio-cultural factors, we're talking about images we see on TV, even our favorite cartoons, for example, um, magazines, um, and advertisements, and of course, social media, and then toys. If you look at toys for kids from Barbie dolls to GI Joes, they are suggesting some example of what is an acceptable way to 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 appear and uh so so those social cultural factors at age six i hope as we think about when we were six i hope there's a moment where we just pause and have a lot of compassion for our little selves and then the body dissatisfaction um, starts around that time and by late elementary school, research shows us that up to 50% of girls are already dissatisfied with their weight and shape and have already developed pervasive negative body esteem. Can you believe that? It's heartbreaking. So then we go into pre-adolescence to adolescence, and this is uh, not our most uh, fabulous time, as many of us may remember. Unfortunately, body satisfaction is at, as, at its lowest as we go through those developmental years, 12 to 15. And it's um, unfortunately, body satisfaction is a huge part of self-esteem. So it makes sense that if we're dissatisfied with our bodies, our self-esteem is also possibly at its lowest. And that's when we're at high risk, as you've probably been reading for our teens, high risk for depression, self-harm, eating disorders, and anxiety, all of that gets bundled together at that age. I'm just looking at the chat because there's a couple of uh, comments that have come in that I just wanted to um, see. Yes, absolutely. Uh, body image awareness starts so young and uh, one of our participants has shared that it started for them at age eight. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's go to our next slide. And uh, you're not alone there. Um, research shows that up to 80% of all 10 year olds are afraid of being fat, meaning being in a higher weight body, which shows you the prevalence of the social pressure that our little kids are already picking up on, that being in a higher weight body is not a good thing. Like this is crazy that that messaging is so prevalent. And 42% of all first through third grade girls want to be thinner. Uh, I don't even know if they really know what that means, but they're picking up on this from not just society, but families. So the conversations we have at home are also very, very um, influential here. Let's go to the next slide. This slide I wanted to uh, I wanted to include today because I wanted to normalize normal growth and normal weight gain. In this case, I'm speaking specifically to girls, but it pertains also to boys. Between the age of eight to fourteen years of age, the average girl, will gain 40 pounds and that is normal maturation and uh, I don't have the stats for boys but we would expect to see possibly a, a fairly similar growth over time. The reason I wanted to highlight this is because if a parent is not tuned in to the fact that there is natural weight gain over time as a result of maturation, parents can panic at this time and they can see oh my gosh my kid is gaining weight and they're looking a little chubby or whatever some of that messaging can be, and then bring their kiddo in to us to be put on a weight loss plan. That is absolutely uh, not, not what we need to be doing, nor do we. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that this weight increase over time is essential for us to develop, to become teenagers, and then to go on and grow into adults. And this is not a time for anyone to be putting their kids on diets. We're going to pause there and just ask, are there any any questions thus far on, on what we've just covered? Yeah, I have one question that came through, Mel, um, and I think it's referring back to when you were talking about the four aspects of body image. Um, yeah. Someone asked, what if, we, what if what we see about our body isn't accurate? So what if when we're looking at our body, it's not, we're not seeing. Accurate. Yeah. <laughs> And actually, that's often the case. Mm -hmm. And again, from brain imaging, we've been able to see that there is distortion. So we, we 
we are seeing an image literally through our eyes, right? And that image is coming back through our eyes and then our brain is processing what we're seeing. And we've actually seen that for some people, their brain is giving them an inaccurate uh, perception of what they're seeing. And so that's where people will think that they look um, different to what they think. They may think they look larger, for example, or they look smaller or not as bulked up for guys who want the whole muscular thing. So what I'm saying is that we can't always trust. Can you believe this? Don't always trust what you're looking at in the mirror. And here's one real litmus test question for you. Have you ever looked in the mirror in the morning, checked out, okay, I think I'm okay, come back 10 minutes later and then thought, oh, dear Lord, no, this is this is not good. I don't like what I'm seeing. Within 10 minutes or an hour, yeah. our bodies don't change in 10 minutes or an hour, but our perception and our anxieties do. So that's where I'm saying, you know, spending a lot of time in front of the mirror can actually be um, uh, not a really good thing. Yeah. Let, yeah, go ahead, Alexandra. If there, if there aren't any other questions, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, let's move forward. There's been some comments, but I think we're going oh, yes. to get those. Yeah, um, I just, for Maria, if you don't mind, sorry, Alexandra, I just spoke over the top of you. Sorry. Maria says, I think culturally it's similar in terms of the pressure to look a certain way. And as uh, Mediterraneans, Maria, I think you're in Cyprus, right? Our bodies are usually different to the American ideal. Absolutely. It's not just weight. I think it's also height, skin color and body hair. You're exactly right. Uh, whatever our culture is, there is a cultural ideal of beauty, a beauty standard. But because of globalization, a lot of the American beauty standard, because of Hollywood and, and um, you know, the globalization of that kind of imagery, and particularly because, you know, we are in, um, you know, a, a number of our leading nations are also predominantly have been colonized by white individuals. So there is a white beauty ideal that has been propagated uh, globally. So you're exactly right there. There's a lot, a lot here, not just body image. And, and thank you for adding to the conversation. What influences body image? What does this mean for you? So let's talk about cultural, which is exactly what you're pointing out, Maria, and a couple of other comments, right? Every country is different and there, uh, you know, there's body diversity, there's size diversity, there's cultural diversity. And, but let's come back to the basics, genetic diversity, which means uh, depending upon our gen genetic pool, our genetic makeup, we are going to be destined to be a certain height or a certain body shape and size or certain hair color, eye color, um, have more or less hair on our bodies, uh, these sorts of factors. And this so-called globalized beauty ideal um, that is so prevalent right now is very much based on kind of a white um, ideal, blonde hair, blue eyes, if I think of that imagery, uh, which is absolutely such a narrow, narrow, um, uh, in in, what's the word I'm looking at? It doesn't encapsulate, of course, the, the true genetic diversity of the world, which we're not celebrating. Uh, and this is why it's important for us to kind of take a step back and say, hang on a second, this is, this is not inclusive of genetic diversity. I'm going to push back on this. I'm going to reject this. And that's what I'm hoping you might be um, motivated to do today. So this idealized beauty ideal in each culture historically has focused on females. Why? Because most of us, unfortunately, come from patriarchal societies. Globally, that's the case. There's only a few societies out there that um, are led by women, but they're very, very few. So if you're, the, if, you're the, uh, if you're the power, if you have the power in a society, then you get to dictate what others should look like or what you think the beauty standard is uh, for the women in your group. And this is actually what has happened historically. So the beauty ideal, though, interestingly, is not set in stone. It has absolutely changed over centuries, generations, and even recent decades. I highlight that to say that if the beauty ideal is changing decade to decade, how the heck are we supposed to change our bodies if we are motivated to do so every decade, according to the in line with the new beauty ideal, whether it be, you know, the skinny, thin stick, to the butt thing, to the whatever thing, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You can't change your body. So in other words, it's ridiculous, but this is what we're up against. So, and there's also a thing called socioeconomic signaling, where historically 
when uh, there wasn't a lot of middle class and there was just the wealthy uh, aristocracy and more of the, the kind of farming uh, working class society, voluptuous bodies in those times of economic struggle signaled wealth. So it was a good thing to be in a higher weight body because it meant I have lots of food. Look at me, aren't I lucky? But now in the US, the flip has happened. We have a greater abundance of food. We've got a, a larger middle class. So thinness therefore suggests more self-control, morality, privilege. Um, and because in this abundance, it therefore is very highly moral and superior to be able to say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. You can see how there's some of this purity thinking there. And so unattainable thin ideal is now the commodity because we have all of this food around us. I hope you, you I know some of you may be well versed in this, um, but as we break it down and look at how this is just this made up thing, I hope it, it, it kind of stirs up some anger and some desire to kind of, again, reject this thing that um, is, is, uh, seems to envelop us. Um, and now this is important because the pressure to look a certain way, as I said, Right now, the pressure is unprecedented. We've got body dissatisfaction, disordered eating, and eating disorders are absolutely skyrocketing. And we're going to talk about why that is. So speaking to this point about the changing um, ideals of the beauty ideal. So this is an incredible Renaissance art. This is Renaissance Venus, who is the ideal beauty. Um, and we know from um, art depictions that uh, she was viewed as a more voluptuous um, uh, person. And we would look at this figure now and say, you know, a doctor would say you need to lose weight, right? So how crazy is that? Let's go to our next set of slides. Again, looking at how the beauty ideal has changed over time from the corseted, very busty, but also bustled in the back. So, you know, needing a behind there to the Marilyn Monroe, um, figure to the supermodels of the Naomi Campbell era, which was in the 80s and 90s. Um, so as you can see, there are a changing ideal of the beauty ideal through to present day, trigger warning on the next photograph, um, the next slide, to now it's not good enough that we just have supermodels who are looking a certain way. We now expect our celebrities, our musicians, anyone in the public sphere to also fit this beauty ideal. And when I saw this picture of, this is Nicole Kidman, who is, by the way, one of my fam favorite actors. She happens to be Australian, as am I. And when I saw this, I have to say, I, I had a lot of feelings and one of them was repulsion. And one of them was, I, this woman is in her fifties. This is not normal. And the fact that she feels the pressure to look that way, look, I don't know Nicole Kidman, and I'm sorry if I'm sounding judgmental. I'm more making a comment on the societal pressures that women must feel in order to feel they need to look that way. Now, she is an actor, so part of her her, her work is about looking a certain way and meeting certain roles, and certainly that is a personal choice, and it's not for me to comment on that. But I have to say, um, it sends a very strong message about the fact that even in our mid fifties, as we go through menopause and body changes, um, there is still a pressure to look like you're what, 25. Um, and as I was talking to my team about this, you know, thank goodness there is now a move towards more size inclusivity in our models. Um, and so there has been some really positive stuff happening there. But as, as my team and I were talking about this, we were highlighting or they actually highlighted for me that even in our so-called plus size models, they are still expected to have an hourglass figure. So they're plus size models, but only if they still have curves in a certain way and place. So I thought that that was a very interesting um, comment on that. So we're still, in other words, we're still not accepting all body shapes and sizes. You still have to sort of look a certain way, even if you are, um, in a, a higher a higher weight body. Let's go to the next slide. And unfortunately, our guys, as you know, are not at all uh, now protected from this pressure. Uh, Jason Momoa, I loved him in Game of Thrones back in the day. Um, and we've seen some uh, pretty amazing body transformations there for him as he's supposed to look a certain way 
depending upon what movies he is in. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And then, of course, um, wanting to talk about, you know, uh, gender spectrum and uh, gender fluidity. And uh, we have uh, Jonathan Van Ness there. And we also have Bella, who is also in Game of Thrones. <laughs> um, and then Levine Cox as well. So, again, just uh, thinking about for our, our different folks um, and our trans folks, uh, trying to figure out what is your ideal for yourself or what societal pressures are there. For example, Levine Cox, um, perhaps feeling the pressure to look like, you know, an ideal biological female and what pressures that must exert on um, biological, um, uh, you know, what our bodies will allow us to do. So there's just a, an enormous amount of pressure around the appearance piece. Body image and ageing, man. So, you know, you get through your 20s and your 30s, et cetera, then you hit 40 and you start to get wrinkles. And then do you feel the pressure then to uh, to be ageless? And then we have, you know, uh, plastic surgeries, et cetera. But um, as people age, their bodies go get further from the narrow societal beauty standards with the emergence of anti-aging products, we've got Botox, we've got plastic surgery, and we've got, you know, the filters on social media. And I think many of you may have heard about the whole Zoom effect with filters. We've all been on Zoom for the last three years. And then plastic surgery rates went through the roof because uh, predominantly women, but guys as well, were looking at themselves on a Zoom via a Zoom filter, then looking in the mirror, feeling great distress and dissatisfaction enough to go and have surgery to alter their face. So again, what does that say to us about our society um, that is encouraging people to actually have surgery to change their, their appearance? And this is nothing new. We've seen this in celebrities, um, of course, again, particularly in women, but we're seeing more and more of our male actors um, and celebrities also go through these processes. Um, but it does, it does give you a moment to really pause and, and consider what is this saying about us? Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. Take it away, Alexandra. Yeah, so one that I have here is you mentioned pushing back on beauty standards. How do we do this when the pressure feels so overwhelming? You're exactly right. Great question. And that's actually what we're going to get to at the latter part of our presentation today is what do we do about this in the face of all of this pressure? How do we stand up against it and how do we protect ourselves? So we'll go over that in a moment. Okay, great. Let's keep going. Terrific. Okay. So influences on body image, historical influences. You know, when we think about this, the question that comes to mind for me is, who gets to decide what the beauty ideal is? Who's making this stuff up? And then, and then how is this, uh, how does this pressure get embraced by a whole society? And then we behave in ways that make us feel honestly pretty unhappy overall, I would say. So historically, as we touched upon earlier, influence comes from Europe and the US. So if we look at um, even, I want to actually give credit to this amazing book by Sabrina Strings featuring uh, Fearing the Black Body. It came out, I think, just in the last year or so. And she did an amazing job of looking at the racial history and the influence on body image ideals and the beauty ideals as we look at it from a racial lens. Um, so I really want to credit her with um, expanding my own knowledge around this. But immigration and the slave trade led to a melting pot of racial and body diversity, which I think is wonderful. That's fantastic. That's why a lot of us live in New York, right? However, white Anglo men then assessed as they were, it's a patriarchal society, and they graded predominantly white women on the key points of beauty. They felt philosophically this was an important thing to do for society, to have some kind of actual written down commentary on what is the beauty ideal of our magnificent women. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, eating moves moved from the personal to the political. And religion also started to kick in here where religious morality uh, of being pious and pure also got kind of conflated with this beauty ideal. And so we then, that leads us to the corset and the bustle. And so if you were able to maintain a thin figure, 
um, you were considered to be morally superior. Women's fashions magazines uh, started, Cosmo, did you know, um, started, um, what first published in 1886. And remember, this is pre-TV, pre-obviously iPhones, pre-computers, pre-radio. So for many people, their fashion magazine was the only real uh, mode of media. And so women flocked to it and saw the fashion magazine as their Bible on correct etiquette and correct fashion. So imagine the influence and the power this magazine had. And so then thinness became all about American exceptionalism. And again, check out Sabrina Strings' novel, um, historical novel around this. So if we look at this historical, um, uh, uh, excuse me, historical movement through time, the first uh, slide, the first image here is Cosmo. That's actually um, a Cosmo cover from 1917 is that first one. And then in the early, um, in the early, just soon after that in the 1920s, Hollywood had um, the silent movies before we had actually uh, speaking movies, which came in the 30s and then color came a little after that. But with Hollywood came movie theaters. And again, this is pre-TV. So we were able to go to the movie theater and see images of actors and actresses. And that also kind of showed us what was um, the beauty ideal in those female actresses that were portrayed. And as we know, Hollywood and movies have now globalized our perception across the world of what the beauty ideal looks like. The advent of TV then brought those movies that were at the movie theater now into everyone's home. So now we have these images every single day, every single night when we turn on the TV. Then the next here is Cosmo Present Day. This was a cover just last year, I think. And from there, we're now in the world of social media, which means it's not even watching TV every night. It's 24-7 um, scrolling and having imagery um, and uh, the perfect female ideal or the perfect beauty ideals kind of basically shoved down your throat 24 seven. So as you can see, we've gone from being able to read a magazine once a month to every single minute of every single day. So no wonder the pressure and the internalization is greater than it ever has been. So social media and teen peer pressure, just a quick comment here. I just wanted to know, and, and many of you may already know this, but the reason why social media has been so impactful is because Social media, we, we believe, has a, a, a stronger impact than traditional media because the messaging and the images are more targeted. And if the message comes from a friend, we perceive it as more credible and meaningful. So that's, that's a, a really big part of that. Also for our teens with social media, it's important to think about the developmental stage. Remember we were saying earlier at the beginning of the presentation that between the ages of 12 and 15 for our adolescents, their body satisfaction is at its lowest and self-esteem is at its lowest. And that is the time when adolescents start to separate from family and start to try to figure out their own identity. So it's a very, very crucial developmental stage where we are much more tuned into our peers and our peers become much more important to us than what family might have to say. So as a result, you could imagine that the uh, messaging we're picking up on social media from our friends is even more powerful at this very vulnerable stage. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and we know that with friendships, there can be a lot of social comparisons. And we also know the prevalence of pro-dieting and pro-eating disorder websites out there is off the charts. So there's this incredibly vulnerable um, stage where we're just basically brainwashed with a lot of misinformation and myths and potentially very toxic imaging. 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 Okay, let's go to the next one. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about family um, and the influence on body image. And it distresses me to say this, but it is true from all the work we've done with our clients that our family members are normal um, everyday members of society as well. And they are also influenced by what they're hearing and seeing and reading around them. And so really it feels as though everyone has just drunk the Kool-Aid, meaning that parents and family members are also 
commenting and embracing, uh, you know, the thin ideal. Uh, there's a lot of fat phobia that we're seeing in our society, weight discrimination um, and weight stigma as a result of this internalization of these thin ideal um, beauty standards. So directly family can have a huge impact on body image by making comments about weight and shape, uh, especially to developing bodies, um, putting children on diets to lose weight and also teasing. I can't tell you how many times I've heard adults teasing their teenage daughter or son about being chubby or you've got a little belly there or these sorts of things. Um, it, it makes me cringe because that those comments do have an impact. And then indirectly family can also through their modeling actions do speak louder than words. So if indirectly mum or dad is constantly looking in the mirror or making negative comments about their own body, weighing themselves, dieting themselves, um, kids pick up on that distress. Kids pick up on the, the, the message that it's not okay to look that way and it's preferable to look this way. Um, and they want to, you know, um, uh, they want they want to to follow in the footsteps of of what is attractive or what is the right way to look. Uh, personality traits, I will say, can also make some people more or less vulnerable to judgments and comparisons around them. Questions? Yeah, we have a couple yeah. of questions. Um, so first, someone asked, "Do you think beauty trends are like a pendulum?" A pendulum, whereby we go from one extreme to the other. I would say that it feels that way. I would say it's a little bit more of a roller coaster because when I think of a pendulum, I think of us going from, um, you know, let's say Twiggy in the 70s and maybe the heroin chic of the 90s, which was this just incredibly skin, skinny, very unhealthy looking person to the voluptuous Renaissance Venus. And we haven't quite done that. We're, we're not, you know, overall, if you look at the trajectory of models from the 80s to present day, the overall trajectory has been um, a lower and lower and lower weight over time. We are now starting to embrace curves in a way that we necessarily, we haven't necessarily since maybe Marilyn Monroe. So it's definitely, it definitely uh, flip flops around or it shape changes. I think that's probably a better phrasing for it. It shape changes and guess what? our bodies don't shape change as much as we might want them to. Um, and so to be able to keep up with the beauty ideal is a impossible and be exhausting. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do it would be through surgery, which mm -hmm. I, I think is, you know, um, uh, a catastrophe. Next question, Alexandra. Yeah. The latest viral filter is called a beauty filter. I think it's on TikTok. Um, it does change your appearance. And then how do you go back to looking like yourself in real life? Exactly. How do you? Mm -hmm. How do you? And so this is um, this is where um, really being cognitive. So you know how we talked about the four aspects of body image, right? We talked about what we see and then how we feel about it and then what we think about it. The first step, and we'll talk about this, is to start tuning into how do I talk to myself about my body image? And if you're noticing that a lot of that body image talk is negative, stop and think, why? What's going on here? And I would suggest even taking those filters off Zoom or better yet, don't look at yourself, remove the, the ability to view yourself on Zoom, you know, because that only makes us more obsessional. Um, we'll talk about it later, but even we tell some of our clients, if you're getting really obsessional, tape up your mirrors for a temporary period of time, reduce the distress um, to help reduce the obsessionality. Uh, so as you can see here, it needs to be, to push back requires checking in with yourself, finding out how you are talking to yourself about these things, and then intentionally taking steps to move away from that, catch those narratives and challenge them. Um, and use some of this historical data that we're sharing with you today to say, who the hell has the power or authority or right to tell me what I should look like? That is absolutely about oppression. Mm. 
So push back, get angry is what I want to say. Get angry and push back and say, no, you know, I don't need to distort and shape change my body to meet some male gaze and what I'm supposed to look like, right? If I use it, I'm using that in a very binary um, manner there. So for our our non-binary folks, I hope you might be able to translate that to the pressures that you uniquely are experiencing. Other questions? Yeah, we have two more. Um, yeah. I, I grew up in, I grew up with eating disorders and there's a history of them in my family. I now have a baby girl and I'm wondering what my husband and I can do to help protect her. I'm particularly worried about the influence of family members. Can you recommend any resources that might be useful? Absolutely. Um, I would recommend um, going to the National Eating Disorder Association uh, website. We'll put it in the chat for you, NEDA, N-E-D-A. And they are our National Eating Disorder uh, Organization who have put together toolkits for family members, uh, for parents on how to uh, proactively help your child to grow um, in a body accepting way how to talk to family members about what what language and what conversations are okay and not okay in front of your daughter or, or child and also to do your own self-inventory because again we're all influenced by the society that we're um that we live in mm -hmm. uh even us that are fully trained in this have to catch ourselves on occasion and realize that we've we've been influenced um, I love the fact that you're asking that question now, early on. It shows me um, how how tuned in you are and uh, prevention is the best. And there is also some wonderful um, programs out there around helping girls to establish self-esteem that's not appearance-based as they go into those preteen years. So check that out on NIDA. Yeah. Any you. Any other questions there? Yes, last one for right yeah. now. How would someone not uh, not liking their flaws without clothes um, still be able to wear a bathing suit? So they mentioned some specific flaws that they they feel make that they don't like about themselves. Yeah, here's the here's the the key thing. There, if you speak to uh, all of us, have flaws in our body, so called flaws. Listen to us. We all have areas of our body that we're not thrilled about why are we not thrilled about those areas because we're comparing them to something else that tells us they're supposed to look a certain way so that's number one number two if you speak to any so-called um beauty uh ideal which is a supermodel in western society here in america you speak to any of them and they will tell you there's areas of their body that they don't like so in other words no one's body is perfect no one's body is perfect and the other thing that i would also ask is if you're on the beach and you have a look around there's a lot of amazing uh, body and size and genetic diversity on the beach and wouldn't it be amazing if we all just embrace that instead of spending all of our time feeling self-conscious about our cellulite or our whatever and whatever and whatever mm -hmm. um so um i don't have a a, a cure-all other than to ask the question, why am I feeling self-conscious about this, this area of my body? And it's because I'm comparing it to these beauty ideals. And then really it's exposure. It's really about changing the narrative of how you think about those areas of your body. And that's hard. And we'll talk about that some more in a moment as to what those steps are. But yes, you're not alone, unfortunately. So what do we do? This is the big section, right? How do we protect ourselves? We talk about negative body image, which is so, so prevalent. And then we talk, you've probably heard a lot more around uh, body positivity is a, mo a movement right now, which is fantastic. So this idea of positive body image. But I will tell you that a lot of my clients who are stuck in the negative body image cycle feel that it's an impossibility to get to a place of body love and body positivity. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. But what I will say is just getting to body neutrality, where you just appreciate your body for what it can do and does do and how it moves according to your abilities is, is fabulous. Because guess what? At least there, you're not self-flagellating yourself and hating on yourself and giving yourself a lot of that toxic messaging all of the time. So that's good enough to just strive to get there. So 
But to, let's take a moment. What is this positive body image? What's it all cracked up to be? So it's not just the opposite of negative body image. Suddenly we're all loving on ourselves, which would be great, by the way. But it is uniquely tied to some key behavior changes. And these are less disordered eating. So that is really significant there. More ability to eat intuitively, which is, you know, your body's hunger fullness regulatory system. So listening to your body. Self-esteem, positive self-esteem and self-compassion. So as you can see here, it's not just, okay, I'm not going to hate on my body anymore. It's about all these other very, very important um, pillars of health from a physical and mental health perspective that just honestly, the combination of those makes them feel happier within ourselves. And that's something to aspire to. So, but let's talk about just getting to neutral body image. And as I said, this is absolutely 110% good enough. And I would say many of us hang out here and then sometimes uniquely we have really positive body image days and then we come back to neutral. And then some of us fall down to having negative body image days and we push to get back to neutral. So it's not like, you know, we're going to be finally at this kind of golden place. But body appreciation and gratitude are huge. We know this from the research. To be able to appreciate our bodies um, helps us to move beyond the appearance focus. And so this falls in this area of body acceptance. So what we're doing here. The, the task is to focus on the experience of living in a body instead of what your body is expected to look like and what it's expected to do. So the experience of being living in your body. And it's okay to only get to this neutral body image place. So the 10 steps um, that can be helpful to improving body image. Number one, as we said, appreciate all that your unique body can do uniquely. Two, I would suggest keeping a top 10 list of things you appreciate about yourself that are not related to your appearance. How often do we do that? Seriously. I think we're, we're so caught up in self-flagellation and beating ourselves up. And I would recommend keeping this list maybe in a journal and maybe part of your gratitude practice every day is reading through that list and really feeling that in your body. Remind yourself that beauty is a state of mind not a state of your body. So really separating out this, this excuse me, I was going to swear, this BS beauty ideal that has been imposed upon us, not chosen by us, and think about um, the state of your body and how fortunate we are to have a body. And I think this is incredibly important to look at yourself as a whole person, not just body parts. And, and again, I, I like the idea of pushing back on where, who got to decide what the beauty ideal is and really use that to stir up some, some anger, as I said, some dissatisfaction, some kind of hell no, I get to decide kind of what's important to me. So go back to your core values and, and reject values that people place on you that you didn't have a say in. And then surround yourself with positive people in person and online. And that goes back to the question from our participant earlier about family members. I would even go so far as to have a conversation with family members before you have your kiddo over there or check it. You know, so if a family member says something to your child in front of you, check it right then and there. That signals to your daughter or your son that that's not okay. Saddest story I heard from one of our clients um, who as an adult developed binge eating disorder and is now fully recovered. She remembers her earliest memory of her body. She was three, she said, and she had a little bikini on and she shared a photograph of it. And as a three-year-old, you know, we're going through a growth spurt. And so kids tend to develop these little roles um, and, and develop a, a little chubby appearance because they're going to go through a growth spurt. And she remembers at three, her grandmother leaning over and with her finger poking at her little rolls in her tummy and saying, you need to be careful of that at three. And that set her up for, um, you know, a lot of negative body image and such because there was no one there to counter it. So be careful around family. Let's go to the next slide. 
So this is the big one. This is the work right here, right? Shut down the voices that tell you your body is not right or that you have less value because you don't look a certain way. Says who? Embracing positive affirmations along with that ten, top 10 list we spoke about and self-talk allows you to change your internal dialogue. And I will say that this is this may sound like, oh yeah, but this actually taps into something called neuroplasticity to use kind of more technical term. What we know with cognitive therapy and neuroplasticity is that if you change the narrative, even if you're faking it till you make it, but if you keep telling yourself something over and over, it changes the narrative and it actually carves out new neuro pathways in the brain so that your default way of thinking is different to that negative automatic thinking. And that's how we start to change our internal narrative. It takes work, but it's absolutely possible with practice. And this one, wear comfortable clothes that help you feel good about your body. How many of us, all of us, have shimmied into clothes that pinch and don't feel good and where we think, and I think particularly for the females who might be with us today, um, that to be sexy is part of that beauty ideal. Who says? And that's also sexy for whom? If you want to be sexy for yourself, that's great. But I think that also gets very confused in here as well. Wear comfortable clothes. Number eight, become a critical viewer of social media and media messages. And as we saw earlier, the bombardment of, of imagery is more than it has ever been at any time in our entire existence as human beings. So it's important that we start to really think about that and how we feel when we're viewing our feeds, our social media feeds. And you know what? Turn it off. Unfollow. Protect yourself. Do something kind for yourself that makes you feel good in your body. Get a massage, a mani-pedi, uh, a great haircut, go and get a facial. Uh, whatever it is for you, uh, go for a lovely gentle walk with some great music. Whatever it is for you to remind ourselves that it can be a really positive experience being in our body. And last but not least, use the time and energy that you might have spent worrying about food and your weight to do something to help others. And as Gandhi says, uh, or said, be the change you want to see in the world. So that brings us to resources. I think we're doing okay for time. Uh, to help you in this endeavour, we wanted to give you some really uh, positive resources that you could look at. Uh, check out, follow, uh, and some great podcasts as well, as well as also support from us here at Balance on our website. Check out some of our resources and our blogs. And I will also just highlight the very last um, Instagram um, tag there, Redefining Wellness, which is uh, our new business that we've just launched, which is about the whole premises around the anti-diet and body acceptance and body image neutrality and food neutrality. And so there's a lot of really uh, positive things that you can pick up there by following us there. So uh, without further ado, let's take some last questions, Alexandra, or comments. Yeah, absolutely. I'll leave this up for a second if anyone wants to screenshot it to save yep. these resources. Oops, I said I would leave it up and then I scrolled past. Um, so here it is, screenshot it. Um, of course, if you don't get a chance to, you can always get in touch with us and we'll send you this list that we've compiled. Um, here are some of our sources we used in this presentation today. And then yes, Q&A. So we have a question here. How would you address body shaming in the opposite direction? So skinny shaming. This oh, is common yeah. in Indian culture, just as much as fat shaming is, and can be equally instrumental in leading to an eating disorder and body dysmorphia. You are exactly right. Absolutely. And you know, um, I was speaking to some women uh, who, who are Egyptian, and they were talking about the same thing, that they are body shamed. Because again, culturally, there is a beauty ideal. And if you don't fit that beauty ideal, then there is a tendency for body shaming, whether it be in, in, you know, you need to be thinner or you need to be more voluptuous. And again, the question is, who gets to decide what this beauty ideal is? And, and then there's the hard work of pushing back against it. How do you feel about your body? And that's really hard 
when you're surrounded by people telling you that you look wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's helpful to take a step back and look globally and realise that depending upon where you are growing up and what country you're in, the beauty ideals could be different, which means this is arbitrary. It's arbitrary. And your body was designed to, to be a certain size and weight and height. And so trying to embrace our natural genetics um, and to shut that down as best we can and know that it is a cultural phenomena, um, it can be, can be very helpful. So in other words, a lot of this work is, is going to be our own internal work about trying to kind of push that away and realise almost the nonsense of it I say that also knowing just how pervasive it is um, and to really think about how is it impacting you and to, to try to keep internally pushing back and thinking, you know, maybe to think, well, if I lived somewhere else right now, my body ideal would be perfect, you know, or for example, you know, if you have uh, dark hair and um, here's an example, I lived in Japan before I came to America and uh, when I lived in Japan, um, yeah, I was told I was too big and too tall and too this and too that, but I'm also not, my genetics are not Japanese, I'm of European descent. And so that caused distress there, but I had, but then when I came to America, I, I fit in. So we have to think about where we are and what our genetics are and then, and then work to protect ourselves. Yeah. So another question we have, and I'm hoping I'm going to translate this correctly. It was from Joyce. I look at my body as it affects my health, um, my, and I tend to feel better when I think my health is better. How do you respond to what I wrote, health versus body image? Totally. And those two have been conflated. So unfortunately in our society, we have conflated, and this is fairly recent, we conflated weight with health. And the reality is those two are not, are not equal. They are not the same thing. And actually your weight is dictated by genetics. And then if like many of us um, in society, you've attempted to diet to fit this thin beauty ideal, you may have gone through a period of weight loss and then weight gain plus some. And if you do that several times, your body may now be at a higher weight than you were when you first started dieting. And it's actually the yo-yo dieting we know now that impacts health and can increase uh, health concerns. But really health is about a number of pillars, not just weight. And in fact, weight is not very indicative of health, but uh, health is based upon obviously blood work, but also we have to think about mental health. We have to think about sleep. Do you smoke? Do you drink a lot or moderately? Um, and these, and is there any kind of movement in your day? And those five pillars are the key indicators around health, not just a number on a scale. So when we talk about health, we have to check in. Am I, am I taking care of myself in all of these areas? And I, I left out nutrition there, which I mean is, are we getting enough fruits and vegetables, which is where all our vitamins and minerals are from, uh, not from a caloric um uh, diet plan. Yeah. So we have two more questions. Um, and then I think we're out of time. Uh, one that came in and you sort of mentioned this before, but it might be worth reiterating. Are there any educational resources for children on not, oh, on not judging others, body acceptance of others? I try to emulate it, but I've noticed my six-year-old has started noticing when people are, are fat and commenting on it. Yeah. Not in a cool way. Yeah, sure. Different sizes and different shapes. And this is where you can really help and say, yeah, absolutely. Do you know that we all come in different sizes and shapes? Like we have different hair color and different eye color and different height. And I would normalize diversity in that regard. There's a wonderful book that I um, uh, was introduced to for my own daughter called Shapesville. Shapesville. And it talks about people being all different uh, sizes, different shapes and sizes, and it's made for kids. And of course, the shapes and sizes are triangles and rectangles and all of this sort of stuff, but it gives this image, this idea of diversity. I would also put in the chat, if you can, team, to check out this great clip on YouTube called Poodle Science. 
And it's this idea that we're all supposed to look the same, which is the beauty ideal. And the fact that we're not, and they use the example or the analogy, I guess, of dogs, right? Not every dog is a poodle. Some, some dogs are Cavalier Spaniels. Some dogs are, I don't know, Great Bernards. And they're not all supposed to look like a poodle. And that genetic idea is the same for body shapes and sizes. Keep it positive. Yeah. Our last question. Yeah, last question is, is it possible to shift our language to be more inclusive, inclusive of males? If they aren't included, they feel they don't belong and are off, and often speak up less. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I think so. Um, and we need to because we're seeing now that, you know, 25% of people with eating disorders are male. Uh, for binge eating disorder, it's something like 40%. So, and my language today has certainly focused more on um, uh, a patriarchal society and where these beauty ideals came from. But as you are rightly touching upon, that is now starting to infiltrate to all genders. Um, and we, we briefly touched upon that today, but uh, a lot more needs to be said there because our guys, unfortunately, are feeling the pressure. All right. So I wanted to take over for a moment and just talk about some of the treatment programs that we offer here at Balance. Um, if you're interested in exploring more or learning more. Um, so no matter what level of support you're looking for, we offer um, distinct levels of care to meet specific treatment needs. And these include a day program, a weeknight program, step down groups and individual nutrition services. Um, we also recently launched a flex program where we really customize the schedule to your needs and your life, which is pretty incredible if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, so like I said, no matter what level of care you need, we'll really meet you where you're at and make sure that you're getting treatment that is individualized to your needs or your loved one's needs. Um, so we do offer a free confidential discovery call so that we can guide you to the next right steps for you. And we will put the information for that in the chat. So if you're ready, we would love to talk to you. Our admissions team is amazing and waiting to hear from you. Um, so that's it for today. Thank you all so, so much for joining us. And thank you, Mel, for taking the time to share your insight and expertise with us. Um, this has been really a wonderful conversation, uh, and I'm so glad to have been a part of it. Um, we'll be sharing a few more resources directly from us here at Balance in the chat. So you're welcome to continue engaging with us. We offer free support groups. Our next one is March 18th at 11 a.m. with Mel as well. Um, you can book a consultation call. You can book an assessment. Whatever you're looking for, please don't hesitate to reach out. So in the chat, you will see um, the form to fill out for the 20 minute consultation call. You can also access our past webinars on our YouTube channel um, and really so much more. Um, also be sure to keep an eye out for our emails. We have lots of exciting announcements there and free resources like webinars like this, like our free support groups um, and all of that. So finally, you can always reach out to us directly by calling us at 212-645-6903. And again, all of that information will be in the chat for you to access. Thank you so much for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Mel. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Alexandra. Bye for now.